my pleasure to have you here today with my colleagues across the Department of Education for the second of three webinars focused on the department's inaugural learning agenda. And today we're going to focus on the part of the learning agenda that's related to building evidence related to students' social, emotional, and academic needs. Uh, my name is Matt Soldner. I'm the commissioner here at IES of our National Center for Education, Evaluation, and Regional Assistance, and I have the pleasure of also serving as the agency's evaluation officer. Before we jump in, just a few last minute housekeeping details as folks join us. First, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be shared, so please keep that in mind if you choose to come off uh, mute or go on camera. We will be using auto-generated captions today. If you need them, please go ahead now and turn them on by going up to the more button at the top of your screen. Also, while you're there, please go ahead and mute yourself. We'll keep your cameras and your microphones off during the formal presentation uh, to avoid any accidental distractions. Um, we'll reopen the chat and the cameras and the microphones during Q&A. And finally, we really do want to save time at the end of today's sessions for questions. Um, we'll take questions we received in advance of today's meeting first, uh, but once those are done, we'll go ahead and make space for you to put questions in the chat, or if you're feeling brave, go ahead and raise your hand to be recognized. So with that, let's go ahead and jump on in. Um, I am really pleased to be joined by a wonderful colleague um, who many of you probably know, um, Ruth Ryder, our Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, the mission of OESE is to um, ensure that uh, we are empowering states and districts and other organizations to really meet the diverse needs of every student by providing leadership, technical assistance, and financial support. And as I think many of you probably know, Prior to being an OESD, um, Ruth was in our Office of Special Education Programs, and so she brings a real depth and wealth of experience, both of the department and working with students, states, districts, and educators. So I'm super glad she's with us today. And in a few minutes, um, I will turn the presentation over to her to introduce herself and to begin sharing information about the department's policy priorities. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Matt Soldner. I'm here in IES, where I serve both as commissioner for NCEE and our agency chief evaluation officer. If you're not familiar with the structure of the department or IES, just know that IES is the department's evaluation, research, and statistics arm. Um, today, though, I'm taking off my IES commissioner hat just a bit and instead putting on uh, my chief evaluation officer hat. That's uh, a role that is department wide, not just relevant um, to uh, the work I do here in IES. Today, we really hope to work through uh, four topics. We'll start, for those of you who weren't able to attend the first session in this, in this series, with just a bit of background about what a learning agenda even is, how it supports evidence-based policy making, and kind of how we came to be together today. Once I've done that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ruth, and she's going to spend some time talking with all of us about the department's goals and objectives related to supporting students' social, emotional, and academic needs. And I'm really excited about her presentation today because she'll be talking about some activities inside that broad category that I'm not sure are really well known outside the department yet. And so you really are going to have a chance to hear um, directly from her some information um, that, although of course public, um, is new to us as a department and really an area that is exciting, uh, both in terms of our practice and our evidence building. Once Ruth has done that, um, I'll come back and talk a bit about the evidence building activities that we are already undertaking to address the issues that Ruth has raised, as well as a few others are inside this broad category. Um, and then finally, um, we're gonna make an ask of you. Uh, and that ask is helping uh, us really turn the learning agenda into a living and actionable document, asking how it might be that you would become um, engaged in our evidence building work. Um, as a reminder, this is the second of three workshops. Um, the third workshop coming up in February will focus on post-secondary education, and we are really lucky to be joined in that session by our Deputy Undersecretary, Jordan Matsudaira. 
And if you missed the first webinar and want to go back and take a look, um, it focused on strengthening the teacher workforce, you can find a copy of that video on the IES YouTube channel. So with that, let me give you some background. And I know for some of you, this may be information you're already familiar with, but just in case, if you don't know what this learning agenda language is all about, um, know that it began back in 2018. And in 2018, Congress passed the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. It really charged every federal agency to use high quality evidence to meet its mission. And in particular, the things that agencies chose to focus on in their strategic plans. So their big goals and the strategic objectives underneath. If you haven't had occasion to read the department's strategic plan, I would really encourage you to do so. You can, after today's webinar, go to performance.gov and see not just educations, but strategic plans from across government. And you'll see all of our goals and all of our strategic objectives for fiscal years 22 through 26. The Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, or the Evidence Act for short, said, agencies, we expect you to use high quality evidence as you develop and enact policy um, related to achieving your goals and objectives. And importantly, particularly for us today, if that high quality evidence does not yet exist, you should be proactively attempting to build it. The priority learning questions that come from that delta, that gap between what we wish we knew to have high quality evidence based policymaking and the evidence we have on hand, those form learning questions. And our highest priority learning questions inside those appear in our department's learning agenda. So, to be clear, the learning agenda does not include every single question we have about policymaking in the department, but it reflects those that, given our strategic goals and objectives, those that are priorities for the next four years. Now, I've used the word evidence and evidence building a lot, um, and I have not defined my terms, which is um, a, a rookie mistake, I guess. So let me offer you the definition that we use internally when we do training on the Evidence Act with our colleagues. So we say that evidence is defined as high quality information used to inform decision making created when the appropriate analytic methods are applied to trustworthy data. There's a lot to unpack there. I won't go into detail as to um, why we chose each word as we did, but I think as you read that, you can get a sense of how we're trying to distinguish um, evidence from information or evidence from data. Our colleagues at the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, have gone farther, and they've offered a framework um, across government for thinking about what constitutes evidence when we're thinking about the Evidence Act. I think this four quadrant slide is really useful um, for those of you who are familiar with the work of IES, particularly the work done in my center, the evaluation center. Often, you know, when you hear me talking about evidence, I'm more than likely talking about randomized control trials or quasi experiments and OMB and the Evidence Act make it really clear that when we're talking about evidence, we're talking about a really broad range of high quality information that can be used to inform policymaking, not just RCTs or QEDs, right? So in that upper left hand corner, you see probably the most common or frequently occurring kind of evidence, um, what we call foundational fact finding, really just descriptive information that tells us what's happening on the ground. It could be qualitative or quantitative, really just designed to give us a sense of what's happening. Another kind of evidence that we often build through our programs and through our grants is information about our performance. And that kind of evidence gives us insight into whether we are making progress towards our agency goals or whether grantees are making progress towards um, the own goals they've set for their work. Uh, on the bottom left in green, you'll see policy analysis. What might happen if we enacted a particular policy? What do we think did happen um, as a result of that? Often you'll see that inside the department through what we call our regulatory impact analysis process. And then finally, the fourth kind of evidence, program evaluation. Um, is really asking what do we know inside a causal framework? What do we know about whether policies and programs work, whether they are actually the cause of an outcome um, that we see? 
but really want to be clear that when I'm talking about evidence today and when Ruth is talking about evidence um, in her presentation, we're not just talking about that lower right hand quadrant. It really is all the kinds of evidence um, that can be brought to bear to inform our policy making efforts. The reason why uh, we've asked you all to join us probably um, really boils down to the contents of this slide, which get to the point of evidence building as a team sport. You know, nowhere in the Evidence Act does it say that the department um, is going to be required to answer every single priority learning question we might surface. And in fact, we can't. It really does envision that there will be enough information that needs to be built that it will take a whole community of evidence builders, um, evidence users, um, and beneficiaries of our programs, all working together, all thinking about what our questions ought to be, all thinking about how they might best be answered, um, and then working a way to really surface the evidence we need to um, develop and implement high quality, high quality policy. So we've certainly been doing some of that um, in ways big and small. But today really is a formal invitation from us to you um, to become a member of this evidence building ecosystem, ensuring we're bringing high quality evidence to our policy making efforts. So let's dig in quickly to the learning agenda itself. Um, as I mentioned, the learning agenda is meant to support our strategic plan. We released our strategic plan in July of 2022. Um, in addition to finding the learning agenda in that document, you can also find it on another site that after today's webinar, I think um, you might want to check out. It's evaluation.gov. There you'll find not just the Department of Education's learning agenda, the learning agendas across all large federal agencies. And if you go inside our strategic plan um, and our learning agenda, you'll see that we focus on six priorities. All six are on the screen. Um, Hopefully, these are all topics that are resonant to you um, and feel like areas of focus that are appropriate for the US Department of Education. Perhaps no surprise, the first focus area in our learning agenda is recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. The second focus area is squarely centered on promoting equity. The third, which we've already discussed in our prior webinar, is developing a diverse and talented educator workforce. Uh, the fourth pillar today is focus, meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs. And then the fifth and sixth pillars are both focused on post-secondary education. The first is increasing post-secondary value by focusing um, on efforts to uh, increase affordability and completion and post-enrollment success. And the sixth pillar specifically focuses on effectively managing our federal student aid programs. And as I mentioned, those last two topics will be the focus of our February webinar. We developed those topics um, in response to our strategic plan, but we also put all six topics out to the public um, in the Federal Register via a request for information. If you were one of the more than 100 folks who wrote back to us and shared their thoughts um, on those pillars, we sincerely appreciate your input. We combined it along with feedback we've received from our colleagues department-wide and generated the questions that we'll share with you today. Um, I also want to be really clear, as I mentioned before, these are a list of priority learning questions, not the totality of learning questions that we have. If you look at the list of questions in our learning agenda and you don't see important topics, important work that you think should be a focus of the department's evidence building, I would strongly encourage you you to reach out to me after today's webinar. In a minute, we'll share our contact information, and I would love to hear from you about where you think uh, we've hit the nail on the head and also where there might be gaps and where more evidence might need to be built going forward. So as I mentioned today, we're really going to focus on pillar four of our learning agenda, meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs. As we do that, you will hear about pillars one and two, response to COVID-19 and promoting equity along the way. But if you have questions about those pillars as we reach the Q&A session uh, of uh, today's presentation, I'd be more than glad to address them then. And then finally, just a, a brief word about how we think about evidence and policy making fitting together. 
Um, if you look at this cycle, it will probably not be surprising to you. It may look very familiar, um, but what it really is meant to show is this dynamic interplay between policy and evidence. So initially we will identify a policy opportunity and then come back and say, what evidence do we have that we can use to shape that policy to be as effective in achieving our goals as we might want to? And that informs policy development. Policy is developed, it's implemented, and then we switch back into the evidence building mode. Where we're thinking about policy implementation and measuring the implementation of a given program, and then potentially, if it's appropriate, building evidence of a policy's uh, efficacy or impact. Um, then we cycle back up to a policy opportunity again, um, if the initial uh, kind of goal or end was not yet met, and continue to cycle through this continuous learning using evidence to inform policy making uh, until finally we achieve um, ultimately the best possible outcome we can on behalf of the nation's students. So in a second, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. She will be focusing specifically um, on our overarching goals and objectives related to meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs. Um, I'll point out that there really are three sections inside of that. Ruth is really going to focus her remarks on some of our newest uh, newest work, but know that we're going to begin by talking uh, about um, supporting students' social, emotional, and academic needs, including multi-tiered system supports and some other ways. We're going to talk about supportive, inclusive, and identity safe learning environments, um, ensuring that students' needs are met. Um, we're also going to be talking about um, the needs, um, meeting the needs of bilingual and multilingual learners today. So, without further ado, I am going to cede the floor to my good colleague, uh, Ruth Ryder. Ruth, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm really I'm really pleased to be here with you today and share information with everyone on the call. And um, I took a quick look through the list of attendees and greetings to a number of our ed colleagues who have joined. Thank you so much for being here. Um, by way of background for uh, those who are not ed colleagues, um, I'm the deputy assistant secretary over a number of our um, grant programs under the ESEA, both formula grants and discretionary grants. And I would say through our work, we are both using evidence and building evidence. And we gather and use evidence on basically all of our, our grant programs through our um, Government Performance and Results Act, our GEPRA indicators, through annual performance reports, through other data that we collect. And we use those data to inform future work and also um, measurement of the effectiveness of what we're doing. And, and Matt and I have worked together extensively on the department strategic plan and looking at how we can most effectively use the information that we're collecting and improve um, the evidence that we have to better support our programs. So this particular topic is one that is really close to my heart. I back in the day, um, I, I trained as a school psychologist. Um, I worked as a classroom teacher and a special education teacher and was really conscious um, all of that time about the importance of addressing students' social emotional needs. Um, and I have to say that the relevance of this work has really become heightened during the pandemic. Um, and we know that students, they have to be emotionally healthy and safe in order to be successful academically. And I think that has become painfully clear during the pandemic. As with other key administration priorities, the department is pursuing a number of strategies to support the field in meeting student social, emotional, and academic needs um, in order to support their success in school and beyond. Um, and the diagram that you're sh seeing shows various strategies that we're using, and I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in my time today on some of these strategies. Next slide, please. So um, here you're seeing uh, two of the, the strategies that I want to drill down on a little bit. So we're going to be looking at the increase the number of mental health professionals in schools and collaborate with other federal agencies and external partners. And I just I wanted to mention that I, I recently had an opportunity um, to have uh, some conversations with state principals of the year. And 
they wanted to talk about the social emotional needs of of their students, also their um, their workforce, their teachers and other others. But I, just talking about the needs of students. Um, they particularly were focused on the need for collaboration with outside providers, particularly for students with more significant mental health needs. So I, I, I want to move on now to take a look at some of the recent data. Um, Matt, next slide, please. So um, I recently had an opportunity to review some data that became available from the School Pulse Survey, and if you have not reviewed the data that is coming out of the school pulse surveys that are are regularly um, administered and data is coming out um, almost every month on these. The the one I, I really encourage you to take a look at them. They're a great source of data and, and Matt can tell you where to find them. Um, and this link will take you to the A April um, school pulse panel nicely presented in a, an infographic. So um, this is just some information about what we're hearing from people actually out in schools doing the work. And 70% of public schools reported that the percentage of students who have sought mental health services has increased since the start of the pandemic. 29% um, of public schools reported that the percentage of staff who have sought mental health services has increased, and 56% of public schools reported they moderately or strongly agree that their school is able to effectively provide mental health services. So that leaves a pretty sizable number that feel like they need more support. Next slide, please. And I, you know, I think that what that leads us to is recognizing the need for an increased number of providers and number of support, um, amount of support to teachers and students um, working in our schools. And um, we had the great opportunity through the passage of the Bipartisan, Safe, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act or the BSCA or the BISCA, as some people call it, um, which was passed on June 25th that legislation expands vital mental health services and provides additional support for states and districts to design and enhance initiatives that will promote safer, more inclusive, and positive school environments for all students, educators, and staff. The passage of the BSCA provided a, a huge boost to the field in terms of funding to support increases in mental health professionals in schools. So some of the BSCA funds have gone out by formula and some have gone out competitively. And I'm going to speak to, um, to both of those a bit um, and encourage you to think if you are out in a school system or supporting school systems, um, how you may um, encourage thinking about the use of these funds. Uh, the, the BSCA formula funds um, included $1 billion that was distributed through Title IV Part A of the ESEA, and that money went to SEAs to competitively award subgrants to high needs LEAs to establish safer and healthier learning environments and to prevent and respond to acts of bullying and violence and hate that impact our school communities at both the individual level and in, in some cases in the systemic levels across programs and activities. The department has designated this component of the BSCA, the Stronger Connections Grant Program, so Stronger Connections. And these funds we distributed to states in September um, of this last year, um, 2022, and they were provided to states um, for them to work with to design their program. So they have to create a definition of high need LEA. The um, BSCA statute did not define high need LEA, specifically left that to states. And also they have to um, develop a competition for distributing the funds to high needs LEAs. Um, we did receive information from states in December 
about their progress in carrying out these activities. We're um, analyzing that information now. Um, we, don't, we do know that many states are using a multifaceted definition of high needs. So on the slide, you can see some of the things that we encouraged states to look at in um, developing their definition of high needs LEAs, and many states are using multiple of these factors. Um, and states are, uh, some of them are working with stakeholders in school districts and in their um, advocacy communities and associations to think about how they want to do this definition, how they want to distribute the funds. Um, the really nice thing about these funds is they're they're available for use under um, Title IV, Section 4108. Um, and 4108 is about safe and healthy students. It's about using funds to support safe and healthy students. And there is a very broad ability to use the funds everywhere from um, supporting student mental health to supporting school safety, supporting some social emotional learning. Um, and supporting professional development. So a lot of great opportunities here for states. Next slide, please. So that was the formula part of the BSCA. The discretionary part of the BSCA is related to increasing the number of mental health professionals in schools. And um, we ran two grant programs um, and these grant programs, each one of them was about $144 million um, for five years. And the you can see the competitions um, listed here on the slides. For school-based mental health, we made 103 awards in late December, 10 awards to SEAs and 93 awards to LEAs. Um, we'll be posting that information um, about the grantees, the abstracts and so on on our website in the next several weeks. On the mental health services professional demonstration grant program, we made 67 awards in that one, 52 to IHEs, three to SEAs and 12 to LEAs. Um, we did not use all of the available funding, so we opened a second competition on November 28th. And the deadline for transmittal of applications for this um, second application is January 27th, 2023. So um, if, if you are involved with one of those grant programs, great. If you're interested in the mental health, um, we have done a couple of pre-application webinars. Obviously, there's not a lot of time left, but um, encourage you to take a look at it. See if your state or any LEAs in your um, area that you're working in um, have received grants and how you might support them. Next slide, please. So looking at the, the other bubble that was there, which was collaborating with other federal agencies and external partners, um, we are um, collaboration experts, I would have to say, um, and that goes for my colleagues here in OESC, my colleagues in OSEP, um, and you know, across the department. We work particularly closely with Health and Human Services. Um, we co-fund StopBullying.gov, um, which is a, a really useful website around um, supporting um, agencies that are working on reducing um, bullying that might be going on in their school. We work around early learning. We work with HHS around mental health, social, emotional. We work with them around substance um, abuse, human trafficking, foster care, homelessness. So just a, really a variety of, of areas. Um, we work a great deal with, with SAMHSA around um, mental health and social, emotional issues and substance use issues. Um, the information that you see on the slide talks specifically about some of those partnerships. So we um, have worked with them around expanding mental health, Project AWARE, some of you might be aware of. We've been engaged with that um, and are um, demonstrating coordination with a number actually of joint letters that have come out from Secretary Becerra and Secretary Cardona. Um, the one specifically that is mentioned here is about the use of relief funds to support children and students' mental health needs. 
Um, and the, all of these can be found on the department's website. So next slide, please. So we're going to we're going to continue around the circle here and look at um, another of the uh, another couple of the the bubbles leveraging Ed's technical assistance networks to generate and disseminate resources and collaborate and coordinate technical assistance efforts across Ed. Next slide, please. So this is. This is an area that I am particularly excited to talk about because I think we have done some really exemplary work in this area of coordinating our technical assistance. Um, you can see here on the slide that um, the um, Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, where I am, we fund a number of technical assistance centers. We fund um, the comprehensive centers, which coordinate a lot with Matt's office and the regional education labs. We um, fund school climate and safety centers, school improvement and accountability. Um, we fund center. We have a, a center now working around school attendance and engagement, um, equity assistance centers. So we, we fund a number of centers and my colleagues over in the Office of Special Education Programs have a, a really vibrant technical assistance network as well. They have their um, parent center program. They have technology um, and educational media centers, personnel centers, data centers, and then of course the regional education labs um, and state longitudinal data systems and the what working what works clearinghouse coming out of, of IES. So I, I could spend a lot of time going through all of the specific centers, but I, I'm going to um, flip to the next side because what I, I really wanted to talk about a little bit here was all of the coordination work that we are doing across the department and the different ways that we actually provide technical assistance. So um, we have um, a number of centers that are doing one-to-one -one support to states and school districts. We have um, peer collaboration that is going on across states, and we do a lot of those through um, professional learning groups, communities of practice, multi-state collaboratives. You, you know, you'll hear us talk about them in many different ways. Um, the RELs particularly are doing research work and di dissemination of evidence-based practices. They um, are directly collaborating with the comprehensive centers. So there's a, a lot of intention there of making sure that the evidence that we are um, identifying, that we are using that, um, building it through the RELs, disseminating it through the comprehensive centers and our other TA centers. And then we have our other you know, training, lots of great webinars, lots of great resources on websites and and all of this work I think has been really particularly effective and one of the things I would love to hear people from people about is um, how can we be more effective in disseminating the work that we are doing next slide please so I, I did want to talk a little bit about our technical assistance coordination team which um, is Really, the, the pandemic, I think, kind of kickstarted that work. We'd had informal collaboration going on across the department, across the OESE, OSEP, and IES um, centers. We had not had a formal structure for that collaboration. We now have in place a, a, a formal structure, and um, Danielle Smith in my office, Larry Wexler in OSEP, and Matt. Um, here in in IES are kind of the co leads of that group, and it really it brings all of our TA center work together for to make sure that we are not duplicating effort, um, that we are really getting the best return on investment and providing the best product and services to our customers and partners out in the field. So you can see here. Um, we're working together to disseminate resources. We're curating resource because we know there's so many resources out there. And we want to make sure that we are um, highlighting the best available resources. Um, we are doing a, a great series of 
um, webinars called Lessons from the Field. Our uh, National Center on Safe Supportive Learning Environments is leading those, but many of our other centers have participated. And those are really, um, I think, kind of the hallmark of those webinars is that they include every one of them, people from the field who are actually doing the work and we're hearing from them about how they are um, addressing the needs of LGBTQ students, how they are dealing with the mental health needs of their um, teachers in their workforce. Uh, we have one coming up uh, later this month that is on fentanyl and, you know, which has been just such a, a crisis in our nation lately. Uh, we also have the Best Practices Clearinghouse, which is a website where we are um, curating resources from the field as well as from our TA centers. And we are now beginning to really highlight the raising the bar literacy and math work, the STEM work, and the high quality uh, training that we are providing across all of our different centers. So some great work going on there across the department. So next slide, please. So I want to finish just briefly talking about the final two circles using the secretary's supplemental priorities and meeting students' social, emotional, um, academic needs, learning from investments in education, innovation, and research. So um, the secretary's supplemental priorities are a really important set of priorities identified by the administration that really set out what is important to them. They are directly aligned with our strategic plan. So I think when we're, we're looking at how the department is organizing its work, it's very purposeful and with great intention. So in looking at the secretary's supplemental priorities, one of them is um, oriented toward meeting students' social, emotional, and at academic needs. And in 27 of the competitions that we ran last year, nine of them had competitive priorities related to meeting students' social, emotional needs. Um, the other area I want to mention here is learning from the investments in EIR. Um, this is one of our larger grant programs here in OESE, and it is a program that is specifically designed about developing evidence and then implementing that um, at a, a, a greater level and then expanding the work coming out of it. So three different levels, early phase, mid phase and expansion phase. And we learn a lot from that, but there is a um, a congressional directive that we spend a, a certain portion of the funding on social emotional um, learning. So we can go in there and just know that we are going to have some projects that are going to be designed around social emotional learning. Um, and we the program is about 284 million and about 87 of that is focused on social emotional learning. So you can see that's a sizable part of the investment. So. I, you know, all in all, I, I think we have a lot of great work going on around the 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 different parts of the circle and um, would love to turn it back over to Matt to kind of take us home. Thanks, Ruth. It was really great to hear from you both about the administration's priorities, uh, where we've been, where we've been succeeding, and also where we're headed. So, so thank you so much. And don't worry, Ruth is going to stick around. She will be available to answer questions in the Q&A at the end of our time together. So uh, Ruth mentioned the department's priorities, goals, and objectives several times. On this slide, what you'll see is a quick snapshot of the specific strategic objectives in the department's strategic plan um, that really pertain most directly to meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs. And you'll see that they are aligned to four different priority learning questions that we have in our learning agenda. So I'm not going to make you read this slide. Instead, we're going to dig into each of those four questions. I'll say very briefly a bit about what we're doing um, and then invite you to help us think about where we might uh, be able to do more by working together. Um, before I go on to those, I, I should comment though, I mentioned at the outset of the webinar that these priorities, especially uh, work inside this goal area, meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs, are hard to disentangle from two other focal areas inside our strategic plan and learning agenda, that being COVID-19 recovery and equity. You really can't think about those in isolation. 
If you'd like to dig in more to our learning questions on both of those topics, I've highlighted a few on the screen here, but really encourage you to go to evaluation.gov, pull down that learning agenda and take a look at the more specific questions that we're asking related to equity and COVID-19 recovery, uh, the work we're doing. Similarly, go to performance.gov and read um, our specific goals and objectives related to the space. Um, we'll not talk about them today, but know that they are woven through, as Ruth noted often, we're the impetus for um, how we're doing much of our work today. So I'm going to go through four prior to learning questions right now. As I do that, I'd love for you to have three questions in the back of your mind. Um, first, you may feel once you hear a question that you already have the answer. And if you do, that's great. We would love to hear it. So if you have information that you think bears upon one of our prior to learning questions, please share that with us. Um, Second, we would love to hear um, from you whether after you've heard these, you are left thinking, wow, there is a huge space that's missing here where work ought to be done. Um, and finally, and perhaps uh, most importantly, um, if you see something in the next few slides that really seems to align with your goals and your visions and you'd like to collaborate, we would love to talk with you about what that collaboration might look like. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are 42 priority learning questions across the learning agenda. We cannot in four years hope to answer them ourselves. We're going to have to collaborate. And so if you'd like to be part of that collaboration, we would love to see you join us. So let me dig in quickly to the four priority learning questions um, that really focus um, on this topic uh, that we're discussing today. And the first relates directly to the work that Ruth was just talking about. Um, so we're really interested in knowing what supports the design of learning environments and education experiences that are effective in reducing gaps in student opportunity and achievement, including those that are responsive to the assets and needs of underserved students. As to all of there is a lot of evidence that we want in this space, I have just two examples here um, on the slide. So one example, um, is really what we call that foundational fact-finding kind of evidence, conditions on the ground. How are states and districts using federal funds um, like those in Stronger Connections to do that fostering of safe, healthy, and supportive schools? And Ruth began to tell you how we're starting to build evidence in that space, both initially by looking at um, state plans, but also through collaborating with OESC and my evaluation office to really design a multi-year plan of work to better understand um, how Stronger Connections is being implemented, and importantly, surfacing challenges and bright spotting successes that we can lift up um, to hold up as exemplars that others might choose to learn more about and perhaps implement if it works um, in their context. Um, second, as relates to the mental health grants in particular, we are really interested um, in understanding approaches that states, districts, institutions of higher education are using to increase the number of mental health professionals in schools, uh, whether that's kind of the, the pipeline program um, through our school-based mental health services grant program and innovative approaches to developing professionals who want to go into schools and provide mental health services through the development grant program. Um, if this is an area of expertise for you, we would love to engage in ongoing dialogue. This is newer work for the department, not brand new, but newer. Um, and so if you have expertise, um, in the preparation of folks in mental health services, um, in school-based mental health services. We'd love to continue to be in dialogue with you. Our second question, what's effective in promoting students' social and emotional learning and development so that every student can reach their fullest academic potential? Um, Many of you know, um, if you've been following the work of the department, that for several years, we really have emphasized the use of multi-tiered systems of support and similar frameworks. So one question we have kind of inside this is, how can we continue to build the evidence base of how we use frameworks like an MTSS um, that's designed to bolster students' social, emotional, academic learning development? How can we make those more effective? Some of you may have seen recently IES released a report um, on the use of multi-tier systems of support uh, related to improving student behavior and the specific implementation of MTSS for behavior. We're doing similar work in literacy um, in the evaluation context. Elsewhere, inside our National Center for Special Education Research, we have a really interesting plan of work 
called ITMSS, MTSS Research Network, the Integrated MTSS Research Network, that's talking about the integration of both academic and behavioral support systems at the same time. You can learn more about that work um, at mtss.org. And then similarly, because MTSS is a framework into which you have to place high quality evidence-based practices, we continue to want to build evidence about the efficacy of individual interventions and individual practices that can support um, students' social, emotional, and behavioral learning and development. Um, if you follow our research grants in the National Center for Education Research, you might know that our social and behavioral context for academic learning is one of our largest grant portfolios. We have work underway inside that portfolio um, that focuses on exploration, really trying to identify promising practices um, that can actually improve um, students' SEL, and it might be the building blocks for new interventions. We're doing innovation grants to turn those promising practices into full-fledged interventions, and then doing pilot tests of them. And then finally, we're doing efficacy trials, taking uh, those things that look to have the greatest evidence of promise through our work in pilots, testing them in a rigorous fashion, beginning to really learn what works inside this space. I should note, if you look um, in our strategic plan in the learning agenda, you'll know that you'll notice that um, we're interested in more than just the issues we've had time to talk about today. So I want to be sure we give specific mention to two of those. Um, the first being um, secondary career technical education, the second being multilingual learners. So in the career and technical ed space, we're really interested in building evidence um, about who at the secondary level is participating in career technical education and the kind of outcomes they're attaining and how that's changing over time. We're interested in how folks who are receiving CTE funds um, are administering and delivering those services um, and to what extent do we see folks in the CTA spaces and states and districts doing that in a way that really comports with um, kind of advances in the law um, to do that work. Um, we're collaborating with another office inside the department, um, OCTE, our Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, to sponsor the national evaluation of CTE under Perkins 5. And then finally, much like in the MTSS space, we also need to know what are the specific individual interventions, the specific practices inside this space that can really help move the needle um, and improve folks' outcomes in CTE coursework, their academic pursuits, and obviously, ultimately, their transition to the workforce. So again, in collaboration with OCTE, we're doing Great work in our National Center for Education Research around um, the CTE Research Network, which you can learn more uh, about at, perhaps not surprisingly, cteresearchnetwork.org. Um, they're really focusing um, on uh, work in really um, six promising programs in the high school CTE space, evaluating those rigorously, and then thinking about how they can build the next generation of data-driven CTE professionals and CTE researchers who can kind of pick up the work of the CTE Research Network and then use rigorous research and evaluation methods to further bolster, further expand, and further improve um, the interventions they're studying, as well as new interventions that appear to have promise um, in helping support folks' career development um, as they move into the workplace. Um, and then finally, um, what best supports the learning and development needs of multilingual learners, including, including native language acquisition. So again, we have kind of two flavors of questions inside this part of learning question, both how are states and districts using the resources that are provided by the federal government to enact the goals of Title III, and then what's effective inside those individual programs. And so in collaboration with OESE and our Office of English Language Acquisition, we're currently doing a national evaluation of Title III implementation, really focusing on how states and districts are using Title III funds um, to support English language learners. And then inside the efficacy space, we have, again, a variety of research grants and evaluation activities really trying to identify 
what are the next generation of interventions we can deploy in classroom uh, to support multilingual learners, whether it is related to improving literacy and reading comprehension, whether it is culturally and linguistically responsive science instruction, approaches to strengthening collaborations between schools, educators, families, and communities, or improving teacher professional development, uh, making them better able to uh, meet the needs of English language learners. So a lot happening inside this space um, of meeting students' social, emotional, and academic needs um, really across virtually every office in the department, IES, OESE, OELA, our friends in uh, Akte as well. Um, it is a team sport, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we really would invite you to join our team. Um, if you or others um, in your networks share our passion for any of the topics that we've talked about today, um, we would really invite you to collaborate with us. And as I mentioned, each of the priority questions that we've posed um, are huge in space, and we're unable to handle um, that ourselves. And so we invite you to join us in doing that work. Um, so collaboration could have lots of different flavors. Again, as I mentioned, it could be engaging around your existing work or work you've already done. It could be learning more about the opportunities we have here at Ed um, to provide you resources to do work that's aligned with our agenda, um, or it could simply be hearing more from you about what your priorities are and how they might or might not align um, to what we're interested in. If you want to talk more about any of this, we have an email address, evidence, at ed.gov that would encourage you to write to. Um, you can send to that address or you can reach out to either myself or individually. We would love to talk more. Um, we're about to move into the Q&A session. Um, so if anything that Ruth or I have said today that uh, uh, has piqued your interest and that causes you to want to ask a question of us, now's the time. Um, go ahead, jot that down. Before we turn it over to you all, though, I do want to address um, one question um, that we have received um, commonly in advance that I just wanted to get out of the way and also give you some time to think about the questions you might want to ask. Uh, and that question is, why doesn't the learning agenda include X topic? So remember, the learning agenda really is a prioritization. Uh, and that prioritization is set by the department's goals and strategic objectives. As you all well know, there are professional staff across the department who are working in issue areas that we have not even begun to address today. Ruth mentioned several inside her remarks earlier. Um, and Questions related to that work don't always appear in the learning agenda, and that really is a function of the limited resources we have for evidence building. Um, but please know that because X does not appear in the learning agenda, uh, that does not mean it is not something we believe to be important. And again, if, if you see the area in which you work not represented in the learning agenda or discussed today, um, please do reach out. Um, we don't have unlimited extra bandwidth, but we always are willing to think about how we can um, stretch our dollar and our resources further to build more evidence um, in spaces where it is definitely needed. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to turn the recording feature off and I'm going to turn chat uh, back on. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and get ready to put it in the chat in just one second.